Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M by 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. And in support of that mesh mission, we do these roundtables, these free mentoring sessions, every week, week after week after week. This is the 487th session, so you can imagine this has been going on for a long, long time. We started back with an experiment in the fall of 2008 and uh, have worked with over 150,000 people in these sessions. The event is being recorded. This and every single roundtable recording is available on our YouTube channel, One in One in Roundtable. We're also on Twitter, and the handles are at 1M by 1M and at Romana. You're welcome to follow. There's a lot of interesting content that we publish through those two channels. If you're live tweeting today, use hashtag 1M1M. Um, this is a roundtable not a broadcast, so definitely we want you to participate and we will open up the line for call-ins a little bit later. We're not quite ready. Right now we have scheduled programming for it. We are going to begin today's session with a conversation with Christian Schernick, founder and CEO of Round 2 Capital Partners. Christian, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ramana. So let's get acquainted. Let's get you introduced to our uh, community here. Tell us a bit about yourself as well as about the funds Round 2 Capital Partners. Great, yes. Thank you for, for having me here. Um, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, yeah, so we, um, I founded Round 2 Capital uh, now it's uh, three years ago, uh, we run a 20 million euro fund currently. Um, and what we are doing is investing into uh, tech scale-ups, uh, not early stage startups, but those that, that already have a million euro or are around a million euro uh, in, in turnover uh, using a, a revenue-based finance product. So that means that we don't invest into the equity, but we basically buy a share in the in the revenues of those companies that we invest in. This, so, uh, I mean, the, the yep. Uh, let's understand the model a bit better because uh, obviously it's slightly different from what we normally uh, encounter. So you're saying you want to see a million dollars in revenue already. That has been what bootstrap. This is a million dollars of bootstrap revenue already happening in the company. That's right. That's uh, ideally uh, the company is fully bootstrapped, or it has an uh, angel investor or two angel investors. But but typically they are not uh, uh, sponsored by VC firms. So uh, we are looking into cases where the entrepreneurs have been building the business uh, on their own. And is there a particular business model that you're looking for? Is this like a $1 million in ARR, annual recurring revenue for a SaaS business, or it's $1 million of any kind of revenue, any kind of business model? It's not necessarily SaaS. Uh, we prefer SaaS uh, because uh, the, the, the revenues are recurring, so you, you run a subscription model. Uh, where uh, uh, I mean, there's some kind of stability in, in the in the revenues the, the companies are generating, and uh, the gross profit margin is very high. So there is not a lot of uh, material cost, uh, if any, other than for Amazon Web Services or something. Uh, uh, there's a um, low need for working capital. Um, uh, that's so to say, that the preferred businesses. We we can also invest in other businesses than SaaS. But then they have to have high gross profit margins and, and low working capital needs so that the company okay. can be scaled without major needs in, in capital. And what kind of check sizes do you write into these situations? 
I mean, we write checks between uh, 300,000 euros and 2 million euros. That's where we are at the okay. moment. So, um, and we have invested across all of those sites. Um, 300,000 euros and to 2 million euros. And, and what are you, uh, just give us an idea about the terms. If, a, if an entrepreneur has bootstrapped to a million dollars, and wants to raise 300,000 euro with you, or let's say a million euro, what kind of terms are they uh, dealing with here? Yeah, so, so the major differentiating factor is that we don't interfere into the cat table. So uh, my philosophy and our philosophy is that we really want to help entrepreneurs to grow their business and, and let them stay in control. Um, so, Therefore, what we do is we, we, we fund uh, the companies and we get a, a share in their revenues in return. Uh, uh, the revenue shares are typically between three to 5% of the turnover. So let's say you have a business that is generating $100,000 uh, per month in revenues. Uh, if we have a revenue share of 5%, then we would get $5,000 each month as a, as a repayment of the funding. Uh, and we don't get this forever. Uh, we get this uh, revenue share until a certain cap is reached that we define once uh, when we enter into the business. And the caps, they vary between 1.35 to two times the funding amount. So if we uh, very okay. easily, if we fund a company with a million, we get the revenue share until we have two million back. So it's like a debt that is paid back as a part of revenue share with some multiple of the revenue as the cap. That's the model. With some multiple of the funding amount, yes. Funding yes. amount. So okay. if, we, if we fund half a million, uh, we get the revenue share until, let's say, we have a million back. Right. And then the, and then the, the financing ends. Um, so, if there's an exit before that, that's, that's nice for us, so that's good. Uh, we have nothing against it. Uh, then, we, then we normally exit the business as well uh, in, in, at times of the change of the control. Uh, if there's no exit, then we don't care. We just have the revenue share until we have reached the cap, and then the funding yeah. ends, and the entrepreneur can stay in control the rest of his life. So this offers yeah. a lot of more flexibility for the entrepreneur. Uh, we don't force them to sell uh, or, or to yeah, uh, very aggressively uh, um, pursue uh, an extremely steep growth path. If they want to do this, of course, we are very happy and we, we support them. But if they don't want to do that, that's fine for us as well. Yeah, OK. And uh, what about geography? Where are you doing this? Yeah, so we are an Austrian Swedish fund. Uh, uh, basically, uh, we 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 are located in Vienna in Austria and in Stockholm and in Sweden, um, and we do deals uh, currently mainly in the German-speaking part of Europe. So that means Austria, Germany, uh, Switzerland, and in the Scandinavian countries, uh, Finland, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, we are also looking into Norway. But uh, uh, we have quite a substantial deal flow, so we get around one pitch deck per day, uh, which is really nice. Uh, and we get pitch decks from all over Europe. So uh, we're looking right now into two cases in the UK. We have cases from Spain, from France. Uh, but this is not something that we actively pursue. Uh, we actively focus on, on, and on the German-speaking uh, part of mm -hmm. Europe and on the Nordics. And uh, how many companies have you invested in following this model? Uh, until now, we have invested in 11 companies. So we, we made our first uh, investment two years ago. Um, and uh, we are about to invest in a couple of more. So uh, I mean, now, of course, we have the COVID crisis. So we, we haven't been doing investments now since uh, beginning of March. Um, but normally we, we do one investment per month. That's that's our run rate. Mm -hmm. 
And let's do a few examples of the kinds of companies that you have invested in. So just pick a few from your portfolio and talk us through what, uh, what they do and why you thought that they were a good fit for your model. Sure. I mean, uh, so um, as I said, we have predominantly invested in B2B SaaS firms. This is around 70% of our portfolio. Um, so let's take, for instance, the, the, the Finnish firm uh, Vainu. Uh, that's uh, a, um, a bootstrap SaaS firm that has uh, uh, more than 10 million euros recurring revenues already. So this is already quite a sizable business. Uh, the guys that have been founding this uh, companies are, are of course great guys. They managed to, to uh, bootstrap the business to that size, um, and they they don't want to uh, um, uh, get involved with any VCs because they are already uh, they have a size already where it's not necessary anymore. Still, they need some money to accelerate uh, their growth. And uh, this was just a perfect match with our with our model. So we can we can provide them uh, with funding. They can accelerate the growth, but they don't have to let anybody into the cap table. Um, we have another case. Um, I don't know. For, uh, for instance, Homemaker in in Sweden. Uh, that's a company that is doing uh, prop tech, um, and they have invested uh, very early on because this went through a Good personal contact, uh, and and uh, we invested a, a very small amount in a, in a very early stage. So they had uh, uh, about half a million euros of turnover, uh, and then we just uh, increased uh, the the funding amount as as the company was growing, and they are now on a very nice uh, uh, track, um, and they they have, have still. Um, basically a clean cap table. Um, uh, well, I mean, we have other cases. We have a, a company in Hamburg, in Germany, called Nubo. Uh, there you have a couple of business angels that, that are uh, invested. Uh, the company is growing very nicely. Uh, they have around, um, I think it's now close to 2 million euros of, of uh, recurring revenues. Um, and they are operating at around uh, break even, and we invested, I think, three hundred thousand uh, at the beginning, and now we just recently increased to to five hundred thousand euros. Um, they have also other funding sources, but we are an important part of their funding mix. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. do you have other uh, uh, firms, other funds that are doing this model that you're operating in in Europe? I mean, uh, there is uh, one or two funds in the UK that that uh, are running this uh, model, and we have seen now also that there is two new funds in Berlin who start to work with this model. Not exactly the same model as we run it, but similar. So mm -hmm. I think we we are really the the pioneers in Europe, uh, and now we have of course other funds that 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 uh, do the same and and start to. To, to copy us in a way, and that's that's really fine for us because it just shows yeah. that our model is actually something Very that's nice. valuable. Absolutely. Very interesting. Very interesting. Now, uh, have you seen any exits yet? Um, I mean, we, we would have had an exit before the COVID crisis, actually. Um, huh. That has hit. Uh, this exit is, for the moment, delayed a little bit. Um, you know, our portfolio is still very young. I mean, as I said, we started to invest two years ago, so um, uh, yeah, we are not, we don't have any time pressure on, on exits. But yeah, they will okay. come, of course. Yeah, of course. So, uh, Christian, there's one thing that I must tell you um, is on, on the 1 million by 1 million blog, we do this entrepreneur journey series of case studies where we invite entrepreneurs who have reached at least $5 million in revenue, and then we do these very long feature stories on them. So to the extent companies in your portfolio crossed $5 million in revenue, you should definitely reach out to us and we'll be happy to do case studies on them so that your model gets more, uh, you know, publicity and awareness. Okay. The new model and unique model, we'll be very happy to cover it. 
I can I can talk to 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 the firms that that have surpassed five million in our portfolio and ask them. Uh, I think that would be great. Terrific. We'll be we'll be delighted to have them in the program. All right. Well, uh, that's very interesting and and a different perspective on startup financing, folks. Um, I'm happy to be able to expose this community to what Christian and his firm Round to Capital is doing in Europe. Um, I have seen a few of these kinds of you know, innovations in early stage financing, which is really important. And I'll tell you why I think it is really important and why we uh, wanted to feature Christian in, the, Christian in the show. You know, there is a, the venture capital industry generally is looking for these unicorn businesses which go from zero to $100 million in five to seven years in this hyper growth mode. And, um, and they're looking for a billion dollar valuation and so on and so forth. But that requires that you have a very large billion dollar plus TAM total available market. And uh, that category of companies that have that size TAM and that kind of fast growth trajectory is not common. Hyper growth and hyper large TAM is not common in business. So there are many more $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, $50 million ideas than these billion dollar ideas. And uh, one of the stated goals of $1 million by $1 million has always been for the last decade to support these entrepreneurs who are working in the non-unicorn, non-venture capital uh, mode. So these kinds of innovations that Chris Chan is highlighting in his firm and in, in today's conversation are really important because this gives us a financial vehicle, financing mechanism with which to finance those other kinds of companies that may not grow at such a high pace and may not be, uh, you know, venture style companies. So, great, Christian. Wonderful. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more on that. Um, no, I, I had an earlier career um, in, in, in academics, so I, I, I've done a PhD, uh, and I was really trained in statistics. And uh, my my uh, my um, my focus area in research was decision theory, and it's it's really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of research showing that people are very influenced by extreme values. So, yeah. and then they overestimate the probability that they will reach these extreme values. I think it's 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 very important to have these role models of you know, these tremendously successful uh, startups. That I think it's really important. But but this is not the norm. This is not reality for for 99.99 percent of all entrepreneurs. And yeah. uh, um, and the economy as a whole is typically built on these mid-sized companies. Not only in yeah. the German-speaking Europe, right? I mean, this is, of course, the strength of the German economy, for instance, but it's the same also in the U.S., but everybody's chasing to become this uh, unicorn, and everybody wants to invest in a unicorn, even if the probability is extremely low. And uh, I think that's really important, and I think it's great that you, that you highlight it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's gives us a good segue into our entrepreneur pitches today. Uh, folks, I want to set your expectations that this is a safe working session. Whether you're pitching today or in a subsequent session, this, we are completely on your side and we're just going to brainstorm about what your options are based on whatever issues you present and want feedback on. It is possible that you could disagree with my feedback or Christian's feedback, and that's fine. It's your venture. You will do what you want to do. Listen to the feedback because, of course, we're seeing a lot, lot of companies and have a lot of experience in, you know, patterns that we see. And remember, as we just said, not all businesses can raise venture capital, and raising venture capital does not guarantee success. We're going to start today with Valerie Mentz in Cape Town, South Africa. Valerie, please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on. Hi, good day. Nice to join this meeting. We've never done something like this before, and I didn't realize that this is actually a pitch deck, 
uh, we do have one uh, which we just finished. So we're actually bringing you our solution deck. So if there's questions, we can answer all kinds of questions. I'm going to introduce Jonathan to do the, the technical presentation uh, on our amazing product that we've developed and designed. Jonathan. Hi. Uh, is that uh, all right with everyone that we just introduced that very quickly? <laughs> yes. Uh, but remember, talk about your problem, what you're doing to solve the problem, and then talk about the yes, business. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. We have all of that. <laughs> Uh, so, guys, thank you very much for your time. I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jonathan Mentz, and I'll be presenting on behalf of Geodata Design. If you don't mind flipping to the next slide. So, uh, a problem that we find in and around the world, in the news, and actually in our neighboring communities is wildfires and unexpected sort of catastrophic events that devastate homes and economies. On this slide, you'll see some of the statistics recorded by the NFPA in 2017. This is focused on the United States. So what it basically entails is billion dollars of damage, multiple lives lost, millions of wildfires reported, as well as an actual 12% inflated cost on handling these fires in terms of putting them out and repairing them post, uh, post the event since 2008. If you don't mind going to the next slide. Uh, we'd like to note here that the, in 2017, there was 70,000 hectares burnt, 18 lives lost, roughly 3,000 homes, and a billion dollars of damage done in California. And I'd like this, to compare this slide, if you don't mind, to the next slide, if you don't mind, trauma, <laughs> where you'll note actually 8,000 hectares less burnt However, the amount of lives lost actually quadrupled. The cost and economic impact multiplied by 10 times, as well as the amount of homes and communities that burnt down uh, increased by 15,000 roughly. So the note on these, this problem is wildfires as well as fires around the world are an event that we still as human beings struggle to combat. And if you don't mind going to the next slide, Trauma, I would like to introduce Prometeo, our solution. It's a geospatial technology deployed in the cloud-based environment, which is able to actually determine higher risk zones of wildfires. In this case that you can see in front of you, we did a recording of uh, California, a segment of California. On the left-hand side, the orange is the Prometeo output a few days before the right-hand side, the actual burn scar of the fire taking place, which uh, I know the previous interviewer said he likes statistics. We worked it out to a 92% accuracy, if you don't mind jumping on to the next slide. Thank you. So we believe that our solution should be focused to every single tier of organization, be it a national body, a corporate, or just a electricity distributor or many different other facets. With all of these things, we focus on four. Oh, do you mind going back there? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. With all of these different industries, as well as types of bodies, they focus on four key pillars, quality of service to any of their clients and constituents, public relations to have a good relationship with your environment, as well as your infrastructure to be able to do your work and focusing on the economic impact. If you don't mind jumping two slides ahead for me. <laughs> Thank you. The solution is comprised of four key pillars, which is weather and climate data, satellite imagery, layered with topography data, as well as the physical proximity of your business or national area of interest where you'd like to determine these high risks. And this forms the Prometeo solution. If you don't mind going to the next slide. The three pillars of Prometeo are built on identification, regular monitoring, integrated work and integrated workflows. If you don't mind trauma, just slowly going through the next two slides so the guests can see. So uh, Jonathan, I'm going to stop you. I have four uh, presenters today, but let's get to the business. What have yeah. you decided? In terms of selling, uh, whom, who is the target audience? You talked about electricity providers, you talked about governments, you talked about cities. Who, whom are you targeting by way of 
your target customer that you're going after. Okay, right, uh, Swarma, I'm going to take that. Um, so we typically, or a company would like to, uh, our clients are typically business to business. So for instance, electricity, the high voltage owner companies, uh, typically railroads. Have you stopped approaching electricity providers, utilities? Yes. We are in conversations with numerous. Forestry, um, railway companies, any anybody that needs monitoring of biomass specifically and specific to um, protecting people and an assets. Yes. And what is the output of these conversations? Have you been able to? Is, is the product ready? Are you able to sell the product? Are people willing to buy? What are you learning? Absolutely. So, uh, Trauma, what we have done actually is uh, operated a few case studies in and around the world in very, very different environments with different organizational focuses. So, like the case you saw in the presentation there, it was focused on the state of California on more of a national perspective. And that would be focused at a governing body or a uh, disaster management or risk management institution. So, someone responding to a fire. Other practices, like in Sweden, we did a right of way, which is for transport or road authorities, uh, to prevent biomass increases along these roadways. And then in, uh, we, ironically, Austria as well, we did a case on railway, where we mapped out the Austrian and full German uh, railway lines and actually determined the biomass risks on the lines. So are these space projects? Or are these prototypes? Sorry, could you repeat that? Are these paid projects? What, what I'm trying to understand is, is this a business uh, that is already revenue generating or is this a concept? I, I'm trying to understand where you are in the evolution of the business. Yes, absolutely. So we have a fully packaged and ready to go solution for the market. Uh, just to note uh, for your <laughs> sort of interest point, what we've been doing is as we're focusing on the scale up period, Geodata Design has been in the market for over 20 years and they've developed this specific IP over the past six years. So we have been gathering data and case studies to basically completely concretely ground ourselves before scaling up and going through to the full market globally. So for the moment, we've been doing POCs with strategic partners in order to have a very strong market presence. And we're just starting to roll out internationally at this point in time. Okay, what's your question? Yeah, so, so, so are you generating already any revenue? So this is basically just um, um, testing the market with your partners. I think what you're doing- So we're not generating revenue. <laughs> Okay, Christian, right now with Prometheus, we're not generating revenue yet. We're, on the ro we're actually on the verge of rolling out. We have two PLCs right now for paying customers in Canada. Uh, we have another product that we don't have time for today to, to showcase, which already is earning revenue. It's, uh, it's a monitoring system for mine, a mining operations, which is highly success, uh, a successful project. And... Yeah, but we don't have time to show you, case you that. We also have a lot of other products in development, and we're doing R&D right now. So, yeah, we, we're very excited. I'll tell you one thing that uh, you said at the very end just now, that you have a lot of other products in development. I think, and that is the philosophy we follow in this program, you should sell what you build before building more products. You should not dilute your resources to build a lot of products without really fully scaling the sales of one product or two products. Um, so I don't know how much revenue your mining product generates and uh, what your business plan is for the, the new product that you just presented, but don't waste a lot of time on doing a lot of R&D and new products right away without figuring out how to sell these products and, and really investing the resources in scaling a, a I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, if I could note on that, Shramana, I know there's other presenters, so I don't want to take your time. So the Prometeo algorithm that we just shortly presented there is actually a single algorithm with different modules that are being developed uh, within slope management and a few other solutions. 
So this algorithm took many, many years to develop. However, its level of outputs through different modules that it can produce uh, does hinder our resource and R&D uh, resources, if I might put it that way. It, it more allows us to focus that sole product and expand on its value addition and be able to fully tailor it to any consumer that we may have of any size. But that's not the point. The point is you're going to need to position this business to a particular customer category and, and provide them with a full product for that category. So if your target audience, for example, is insurance companies that are trying to do the fire insurance risk, right? We, yeah, you talked about California fire. Um, it's a very big problem, and the insurance companies and are – you know, dealing with the California fire threat, if you go to them and you tell them that we can pro help you with risk modeling this whole thing and monitoring and so on, and then you need, you need to understand what else are they looking for, and, and you need to then go sell it to other insurance companies. Before you go sell to everybody and their mother different solutions, each of these categories of customers will have different requirements. If you're talking about utilities, they would have a you know, there are some portion of it is common, and then they will have their specific requirements. And, and, and in our methodology, we believe very much in vertical specific uh, sales strategies, business development strategies. I, I could not agree more. I, I think it's really important that you, that you focus on one particular vertical and one particular application and then try to sell it, sell the product to a couple of customers in, in that vertical and then scale it from there. Um, and not, Otherwise, not, it's not, better not, service uh, business and you have solutions for each one of your customers. All right, thank you. we're going to move on. We can come back to you a little, little bit later once we finish the other three presentations. We will have time for more Q&A at the end, I think. Thank you. But I think this is a great product. I mean, this is, this is cool I think stuff. That, that makes a lot of sense. This is cool. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And it's especially wonderful to see that you are uh, you've gotten this far from uh, South Africa, which is a you know an emerging startup geography. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Bing, you are up next. Hi guys, can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh, hope you guys are doing well and stay safe and healthy. And um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to dive right through it. So try to yeah. save some time for others. And my name is Bing. I'm from Hustlebees. I was in Tampa, Florida, but technically our team is in uh, Sunnyvale, California. So we in the Bay okay. Area. And so um, today I want to want to share with you Hustlebees and hope to learn from you guys. Uh, yes, please. And so one of the big problems that we're facing nowadays is that Americans are bearing total of four trillion dollar consumer debt. And it's about one point seven eight trillion of uh personal loan other loans, like other students and also uh young adults, uh we are bearing about one point five three trillion student loans and uh rest of in credit card debt. So that leads to um a huge problem, not just now but also in the future because poor personal uh, finance management uh, leads to us stock in debt and has off managing all debt and large monthly payments are dragging us from pursuing a normal life with uh, the paycheck that we're having. And also lack of access uh, prevents us to have a convenient way to earn passively. And also, uh, as we mentioned in the long term, this is discouraging, uh, dis discouraging us to consume more in the future from the millennial generation and Gen Z generation. And this is all happening before uh, the whole pandemic thing. And imagine how the pandemic is even gonna impact worse as it poses too much financial structure, uh, pressure on us. So I want to introduce you to Hustlebees and what we're building. It's a uh, one automated platform where you can earn cash back and pay all your loans at the same time. So with us, you will be able to manage uh, and automate all your loan payments in one single platform. You will be also uh, be determined and customize your repayment plan on, uh, with our loan analyzer. Many of the issues we run into as a young generation with finances because we don't know anything about it. And we don't know how interest work. We don't know how can 
repayment plan is manipulated to help us save money and time. And we also are introducing uh, a passive earning, a way of passive earning through auto automatic cashback, which powered by uh, car linking features. And uh, lastly, together we want to uh, in incentivize the consumption with uh, both offline and online merchants. One big bonus is that we're also introducing gamification features such as uh, like student loan multipliers, where when people utilize cashback to pay back to student loans, they will be able to earn up to 100% cashback matching through us, which they can earn extra cash, uh, extra cash to start paying back to the student. Loan. Where is this automatic uh, passive income coming from? What's so the it's, source it's, of the automatic passive income? Yeah, it's from the uh, com uh, consumptions. For example, it's a cash cashback automatic. Uh, auto uh, Automatically, so basically, when you consume at the um, merchants that you already do every day, it could be from like local merchants or online merchants. When you uh, shop from them, you will earn uh, from a range from five percent or up to fifteen percent cashback from different merchants. Okay. Yep. So uh, the tar we are primary target at millennials and generation who's already been utilizing mobile uh, fi uh, mobile devices, mobile applications to manage their uh, finance financially, and that's where we're looking at. And, and find uh, millennial and Gen Z themselves are representing um, a huge portion of the uh, debt borrowers in the United States, as we can see from the data right there. Uh, the consumer there is continue rolling. Thank you, next, please. And we are positioning ourselves in a uh, very highly competitive field, but at the same time, we are trying to introduce uh, what we have that's quite unique to the market is that we are um, sort of uh, piggybacking both functions at the same time and rolling out to the users because as a consumer who has student on myself, I found that difficult that uh, to do both things at the same time, but it could be used, uh, easily put together to do so. So uh, that's why we're introducing personal management, uh, finance management at the same time, along with the uh, uh, passive earning, which is the cashbacks. So uh, if you can see from here, we are offering uh, quite similar stuff to the uh, what app are doing on the market, but with a lot more uh, different features, such as the loan repayment analysis and also the gamification features. And at the same time, we are also offering the lowest price on the market to not just our users. And for example, to our merchants who's partnering, us, uh, partnering uh, participating merchants on our platform, we are also asking, ask, asking them for, for the lowest rate where they can also be benefited of by working with us. Next, please. So where we are right now is we have just grow out our beta. Uh, it's a private beta that uh, sign up only. And for the past few months, uh, it's been about a month that our team had come together and developed this product. And since we launched our website in uh, uh, September last uh, last year, we received about 3,400 uh, beta tester signups. So for the past few days, we are uh, we just sent out about uh, 300 invites, and we got gotten back about 124 uh, beta tester registered beta testers. So that's approximately 50% conversion rate at this point right now. But we're looking forward to uh, grow the beta tester base along with our uh, user base is by through uh, direct to customer methods such as SEO content optimization, social media outreach. Also, um, can we go back very quick if you don't mind? Uh, no, let's talk about your revenue model. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so we are introducing two uh, streams that we are touching on right now. One is reoccurring, one is not reoccurring. So as we're charging $1.99 uh, $1 every month for the users, they can utilize the platform, they can link as many loan accounts they want. They will be able to uh, push uh, automate payments and they can adjust their payment plans through our loan analyzer. It could be weekly, monthly, uh, biweekly. And Using our beta tester number as a uh, assumption, we are looking about uh, this much number uh, 6,766 as a uh, monthly revenue for subscription. It's based on the number of users that we have. Also, the average commission. 
One second, Bing. Uh, sure. Have the beta testers agreed to pay this two dollars a month subscription fee? Yes, they did. But uh, so for our private beta, as of right now, we are not charging them at this point because uh, the function is uh, quite limited right now at the beta uh, version that we roll out right now. So basically, right when now they will be start charging this. We will be start charging when we officially launch on the App Store. When is that? So it's we we, beta, we just start our beta for a month and we will be starting uh, within two months. So we're looking at two July, months. yeah, July or like middle of July or early August at this point. And uh, could you explain the how how you're rationalizing this forty thousand dollars a month um, revenue projection? So this is a uh, as yeah, as you mentioned, it's a very uh, projective number right here. But uh, from the average rate, so with the local merchants that we have been partnered with, we are getting about 15% uh, back from each transaction we refer to them as a commission. And out of the 15%, we are giving back 10% to our users. So we are keeping about 5% approximately as a revenue. And with online merchants, the percentage varies um, across the bo across board with different merchants. Uh, you know, some of them offer average lowest they offer about 4% to 6%, highest could be even around 20%, 30%. So, so your can... business model, hang on one second, your yeah. bis the cash back business model is you are generating affiliate commission and then splitting that affiliate commission with your members. That's mm -hmm. the cash back. Yes, yes. Got it. Interesting, actually, very interesting. Christian, what do you Thank think? You. I think it's 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 great. I'm just wondering a little bit what's really the the focus value add that you that you deliver to the customers. Is it the cashback or is it the the platform where you can integrate all your your um, your loans? Because these are basically two different kinds of of uh, value add to your customers. Yes. Um. Thank you so much for the question. Actually, and um. Uh, so before the pandemic all happened. We actually were fully focused on the uh, cashback because one of our biggest ad competitive advantage is we had a lot of local merchants in different uh, cities such as uh, Santa Clara, also back in Tampa, Florida. That's our two major pilot pilot uh, tar uh, target markets. And but with all uh, everything happened right now, a lot of local merchants shutting off. And I mean, even though they are reopening, but uh, a lot of merchants would not be able to operate in their previous capacity and offering the same uh, term that we agree upon. So we sort of step back a little bit, think about what we can really offer to the uh, users at this point, as they won't be able to consume as much as they previously do. We want to help them better manage their loan since we already been using, uh, already have a fully automated backend uh, prepared to help people pay their loans uh, we decide to, hey, instead of uh, just using the cashback to pay, you can also first utilize our platform to see how man uh, manipulating your payment plan can help you save money. If you like to do that, you can also using us as a loan management. But I, I don't see yeah, why so you can't uh, do the cashback from e-commerce merchants. E-commerce yeah. is very big right now, and, and e-commerce actually gives you a much bigger footprint because you don't you're not no longer limited to local merchants. Yes, we actually have both both local and online right now. So online is what we promote fully right now because local merchants limited. I personally think cashback is far more interesting. The fact that you're splitting your affiliate commissions and offering a cashback to the consumers gives them a way to pay back their loans. Otherwise, it's basically. I don't know. I, I it seems to me that that's a higher a higher order value proposition. Got it. And if you don't mind, uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not sure if it's the time to ask some questions, but I'll, I'll come back later. But uh, here's what our uh, milestone plan looks like. So right now we are basically in our private beta session right now, and we will be officially launched in quarter three, which we will expect it in July or June. And along with that, we want to f com uh, keep on developing our uh, uh, platform, uh, especially in the back end, to fully uh, automate the whole process from 
uh, earning cash back and de uh, deploy all the payments. And in Q4, we are thinking, uh, we are planning on um, start looking deeper into like gamifications where we can really make the process of earning cash back and maybe loan payments more interesting or enjoyable for the users. And at the same time, they will have more uh, opportunity to earn cash back. So for example, some of the plans that in our agenda is a 100 days challenge where users can continue sign up, I mean, check in for 100 days and invite their friends to compete to uh, see who sign in more, uh, like who sign in more often or more consistently. And the winner gets uh, a bigger bonus compared to others, things like that. And next year, we are looking to uh, focus on more, uh, not just uh, online merchants and also offline merchants. So in a way of not just uh, help the consumers ourselves to leverage the opportunity to earn cash back, but also support local business to um, survive and come back to earn more customers. So I have one last question that you should think about is, um, what is your own operating expense? You're operating on a very thin margin because you're, you know, your main revenue model is a 15% commission, affiliate commission, and, and a bit of subscription fee. So mm -hmm. uh, how does that play out, model that financial uh, equation and see how that plays out? How much, you know, what is your burn rate and, and uh, can you finance it with this kind of a thin margin situation? Yes, yes, I'd love to address that. Uh, so actually to date, for the past nine months of operation and development, also with lending partnership with major payment network like Visa, MasterCard, and along with all the merchants, our cost is less than $8,000 in total, including all the tax we pay, and mm -hmm. everything so we don't so for example online so the whole online affiliate the, the from the chain like the whole supply chain of online affiliate that doesn't cost us any money at this point it's basically just human power of uh, manage, uh monitoring the data also uh sourcing the channels of merchants to like fitting that to our users and uh us three has been getting together um working on this uh with no pay and committing full time so uh, there's no human cost at this human capital cost at this point. Yeah, but and at this point it may not be, but there will be customer acquisition costs and there will mm -hmm. be merchant acquisition costs. It's they're not automatic, right? There, yes. there, there is a cost to acquiring customers and there's a cost to acquiring merchants at yes. scale. But for now, you're fine. Yeah, it looks like you're three people doing a, you know, lean startup, and that's perfectly fine. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good luck. And All right, so yep. Angela, you are up next from Petaluma, California. Hi, thank you. Um, well, my name is Angela, and I live in Northern California. Um, and um, I'm really excited to be here today. My um, my just so you know, my uh, my background is as a uh, language teacher, and then I transitioned to um, to social services. So I, um, when I was uh, working as in the social service field, people would say to me, gosh, I wish I knew Spanish like you so I could work with Spanish speaking clients. So I've been, as the technology has gotten more accessible and um, more affordable for me to be able to use, I've been want, I, my, my dream is to provide a, a language school for social service professionals that want to communicate with their Spanish speaking clients. Um, and that would be either in the form of, or one, one product would be, um, is like a, uh, an online course through a platform like Teachable. Um, the other possibility is also doing um, in-person classes through at different agencies, but because of COVID-19, I'm focusing on the online um, product. Um, so the, the, uh, yeah. the language, learning space, language learning app space is extremely crowded, and there are some very successful players already established. How do you compete with them? How do you differentiate? Look at a Duolingo, for instance. Mm -hmm. Look at uh, you know, there there are many players in this space that are doing very well. How do you compete? 
Yeah, you know, I think that my um, niche is is working with students that want to learn the language, not to travel, not to um, to be able to t you know talk. They really want to learn a specific set of vocabulary to communicate with their clients that are seeking services because they're in crisis. Um, and so, you know, I, as a language teacher, I'm fascinated by all these apps that are coming out. But when you look at the research, um, apps like Duolingo only get students to a certain point. The Rosetta Stone only will get a student to a certain point. And there's, um, you know, most students do stop using these programs after a certain point, and they're not able to get to fluency. And so I see it really as a health issue that we need to provide our more, most vulnerable people in, this, in the United States with, with providers who speak the language that they need to use to communicate. And apps like Duolingo or the Rosetta Stone just don't do that. And I, um, there is a certain set of vocabulary that students can learn to get them to be able to communicate and build trust and make an impact on um, on, on these lives that they're you know these very vulnerable people as we're seeing with COVID-19 it's the most vulnerable people that are being impacted undocumented immigrants essential workers these are the folks that need someone to be able to communicate with them in their in their native language so I think that's really what di differentiates me from those apps. And do you have such a product that you have built already? I, you know, I do. I have um, curriculum that I, I have to put on a platform like Teachable so it's accessible. Um, but the, all of the curriculum I have designed, so it's, um, it's, it's in my, it's, it's what I've created um, as with my language background. So, um, yes, yeah, so the, um, the main, and I know we're looking at the customer acquisition now, has been through social media, blogging, um, lead magnets, and email marketing sequences. Um, and if you um, want to go to the next slide, um, currently, um, so my, my main customer validation right now is my experience as a teacher and having the knowledge of the vocabulary and the language skills that these students will need um, because I have experience in both fields. Um, and I've gotten my training at Stanford University, which moves students along to from novice level to an intermediate high. I know how to do you have any, do you have any customers for the course that you have created on Teachable? I, I do have. Uh, customers, but they've all been in person. I haven't put on the the curriculum on Teachable yet. I'm still my my main struggle right now, and my question to you is um, building up building my email list so that I'm able to um, really make it when I do release the product. I'm I'm able to do that to a wider audience, and that's what I'm currently working on right now is producing lead magnets, trying to attract, um, to connecting with potential customers. Well, I would, based on what you're trying to do, I would go try to validate this concept with agencies that provide social workers and train social workers. Mm -hmm. okay. And see if they are interested in providing language learning as part of their a training process to get social workers ready to be able to operate with the, the kind of uh, community that you're talking about, and then you get to ask them that, hey, I have a course that is fit for social workers. Would you buy my course to teach your social workers? Instead of going B2C, I, my hunch is that they should, they, you should go B2B. Christian, mm. what do you think? I think it's, um, it, it, it makes sense to focus on one particular customer segment, like social workers. And I mean, I can imagine that there is some um, specific uh, value that you can add to this specific segment. If you figure that out, 
um, I think that that could make sense, um, even if there are other other competitors, of course, out there, but they are not specifically focusing on this segment. And um, I think it's good to to find the right multipliers, like Samana was saying. That I think that's a good idea because you need to find those customers. And B two C is always, of course, difficult if you have if you don't have a large market <laughs> expense. And, and, right. uh, so then then I think uh, to to look for the multipliers and the agencies and figure out what's the specific value that you can add to, to people in that area, social workers, that could make sense, and then scale it up from there. Okay, great. Angela, there's yeah. one other pointer I want to give you before we go move to the next presentation. Sure. Um, are you familiar with Michelle Thomas, this language learning app? Uh, Michelle Thomas has French, has, has um, Spanish, and I don't know what else he has, but there's this particular learning methodology, and it's um, it's basically apps that you buy, and, and it's kind of like a lecture-based learning module, mm -hmm. and there are eight modules. You buy it in uh, modules of four at once, and then another two and two, or something like that. I don't remember, but it's basically apps. So they, they, he has really this. This company has released these apps on the App Store, and I've actually used them for both Spanish and French, and they're very good. Okay. And the business model is very simple. It basically goes through the App Store. So then if you can create something like this, put it on the App Store, and then you work with the agencies, and agencies buy a certain number of these, you know, for their students and so on and so forth or have their students buy something or the other, you have to figure out what would work for the agencies. That may be a simple way to frame the business that you are trying to build. Uh, build. Right, great, thank you, that's really helpful. You're yeah. very welcome. Thank All you. All right, Prashant, you're up next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, so unlike other presenters, uh, most of them were having a product idea. Uh, mine is not a product idea, it's an IT services company. I checked before I sent the slide that is it okay to present IT services and it seems it is okay. Yes, so, no problem. Okay, next slide please. Okay. So, the company that I am running, uh, its name is Krenexa. Krenexa stands for Creating Next Generation Application. So we help uh, founders uh, having idea, but they don't have a team. Uh, so we help them build products from scratch. And products are typically web portals or mobile apps. And we are majorly focusing on education and healthcare domain. Right? So currently we have around 12 people team. Uh, projects done so far. Uh, are 25 plus. Uh, we, uh, this company is founded in August 2019, but we have been in this business for more than two years now. Next slide. Please. So over 100 plus years experience in the information technology as a team. Uh, and most of the products that How we have developed so far. Uh, How do you acquire okay. customers today? Yeah, so we use various channels. So LinkedIn is one of them, uh, then Telegram groups. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, LinkedIn connections, Telegram groups, WhatsApp group, Facebook group. So Telegram, WhatsApp, and Facebook, uh, these are like people post their requirement that we are looking for an app development agency, looking for web development company. So there, on LinkedIn, uh, we do connect people and uh, we connect with them, build a relations, and it's a long process actually. So. That's how from LinkedIn. Other is like uh, targeted. They need it and we hunt them. That kind of thing. So let's go back to the 25 projects that you have done so far. What mm -hmm. is the distribution of how you've acquired these leads? Where did they come from? Okay. So 30%, uh, around 30% are from reference. Uh, references mm -hmm. like you know a friend and his friend needs something. That kind of thing, 30%. Uh, LinkedIn yes. is 10%. Uh, Telegram is 20%. Telegram and then Facebook, uh, like 20 20%. So that's how the distribution And what is the distribution between healthcare and education? 
हेल्थ केयर एजुकेशन आई वुड से हेल्थ केयर इज फोर्टी परसेंट एजुकेशन इज लाइक थर्टी परसेंट रिमेनिंग वी हैव डन अदर प्रोजेक्ट ऑल्सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल वी हैव वन ऑफ द सिंगापुर बेस्ट कंपनी वी हैव डन एंड्रॉइड एप फॉर इट्स अ फिन टेक कंपनी फॉर वन ऑफ द कंपनी इज लाइक यूनिकॉन दे वॉन्टेड टू डू एक्सेसिबिलिटी टेस्टिंग अ बिग कंपनी बट दे डेंट हैव एक्सपर्ट सो दो काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स ऑल्सो वी हैव डन बट मेजरली सेवेंटी परसेंट ऑफ वर्क इज इन दिस एरिया healthcare and education. so prashant the biggest problem you have is that this is an incredibly crowded uh, business yes It's and um, i think doing you know if you try to contact people on linkedin and pitch them your services i mean i get pitched constantly and i ignore most of these pitches so how are you going to find companies that are you know or or people who are open to or who are in need how do you determine the signal that they have need i think what you're talking about the kinds of whatsapp group or telegraph groups or whatever uh facebook groups where people actually post requirements and ask for project proposals that's a that's a better strategy um mm-hmm. but i imagine those are very competitive as well you get that same thing i you're not using upwork you haven't mentioned upwork upwork is where these companies like you mostly get business from upwork yeah i tried to register on upwork i think it is very crowded now so they are not approving the profile so these days they are, they are saying it is very crowded so please apply again we tried couple of times uh, yeah that is in the list to apply on upwork and there are elance and freelance there are websites we have not tried no, that elance, but we are trying elance and yeah. odesk is the upwork is the combination of elance and odesk so it's the same Uh, so the other thing that i would explore is is focusing on one domain and really developing deep domain knowledge in one domain instead of trying to do everything i know you are mm-hmm. trying to survive right now so you're doing anything whatever comes to you you're doing your friends are sending you referrals and you're doing whatever yeah. but from a strategic yeah. development you need to zero in on one domain and and then do a research on where people from that domain go to look for developers look for you know partners like yourself um whether okay. it's education whether it's healthcare education online education is a very active category right now um yes, yes. so you could go to there are platforms i think thinkific for instance is a platform for education uh, innovators <laughs> you could go mm-hmm. hang out there and see what kind of you know potential um uh, relationships you can build there so what i would try to do is pick a domain and pick a a platform on which you develop core expertise mm-hmm. um okay instead of trying to do this horizontally and do this kind of off the cuff it's too late in the game this business is too crowded for you to be able to do anything you know anything substantial yeah. here without strategic positioning right now it, your positioning is too diluted this can be one add to that yeah. this can be one add to that um yeah i think that that's that's the problem i mean you have many many competitors offering very similar services so if i was you i would um yeah focus on one specific segment and maybe think about the the, the customer interaction process and see whether you can do something differently from all the others um now this is a very much a trust business so you need to um you need to be able to 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 trust quickly in your in your abilities and 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 the, the product that you are producing often you don't meet the people in person and so on so I, i think i would i would think about whether you can find ways how to quickly build trust with with the customers and interact with them maybe in different ways from your competitors um so that you can differentiate yourself on 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 that side also uh, customer service customer interaction um and then of course uh, customer acquisition by focusing on one specific segment mm-hmm. and a specific yeah. platform <laughs> i think you should really choose a platform that has a 
platform as a service strategy and, and learn to build on top of that platform and do services projects for other clients once, once products built on that platform and then you can even start developing your own apps downstream. But I would, I would kind of look at a bootstrapping with a piggybacking, by piggybacking strategy. You can look up my writings mm -hmm. on bootstrapping by piggybacking. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. So right. obviously this is a, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your suggestions, Christine and Tamara. So I know so it's so a commodity business. Our, yeah. um, that concludes our in, uh, entrepreneur pitches. If you like what we're doing here, I refer 1 million by 1 million to other entrepreneurs. And all our resources are available on the website, 1mby1m.com. There is a free blog. There is the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, of which we've published 12 volumes. All of those are available on Amazon. These roundtables happen every week. Um, you can continue to use them all summer long. We're going to be around. Um, the full acceleration program from 1 million by 1 million is the 1m by 1m premium program. If you want more extensive methodology guidance, uh, access to our curriculum, it's a digital curriculum. We help you with business development, we help you with strategy consulting, and we also help you with financing and media relations. All of that is part of our premium program. I suggest you go to the 1M by 1M self-assessment that's available for free on the website. These are the questions that investors would typically ask you. Go try to answer these questions. If you get stuck, do 1M by 1M basic, which is our curriculum only option, and you will learn the methodology that you need to learn. And that's something you can do at your own time, whenever, from wherever. In any case, go dig around on the website, try to understand the program, what to expect from premium, what to expect from basic, FAQs, video FAQs, descriptions of the curriculum, it is a case study-based curriculum, by the way. Over a 1,000 case studies, including 100-plus unicorns, 400-plus venture-funded companies, 400-plus bootstrap companies. It's a very comprehensive program, and uh, you basically get to learn from other people. And that's what's unique about this program. Um, our methodology is bootstrap first, raise money later, and, um, or not at all. You don't have to raise money. We don't force you to raise money. Uh, that's it. We have time for Q&A, as Maureen is saying in the public chat. The next four roundtables are the four Thursdays of June, June 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th. We also have online rendezvous on Tuesday morning, specific time, 8 a.m., June 2nd, 9th, 16th, 23rd, and 30th. Those are on LinkedIn Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live. And uh, if you have questions, you can dial in to these, this number, or you can also ask questions in public chat. We do have time for Q&A. Uh, while you're asking your questions, let me introduce you to Irina Patterson. Irina would be happy to answer any of your questions about the 1M by 1M program. All right, folks, questions for me, for Christian, for Irina, please go ahead. Anybody? No? No questions? Not from my Very side. Quiet. Thank you. You're very welcome. Very interesting session today. Lots of interesting ideas and uh, lots of interesting presentations. Um, Anthony Dobaj is asking, how do we sign up to pitch? Great question. You go to the website, 1mby1m.com, go to the free public roundtables page. You'll see that on the top navigation panel. And go in there, and you have all the instructions, the schedule, sign up forms, and everything. Anybody else? Anthony, where are you dialing from? By the way, folks, you can introduce yourselves. Tell us where you're coming from. Um, San Jose, California, okay? What are you working on? This is also good networking time.
All right. Looks like that's it. Christian, thanks for staying today and uh, listening to the pitches. And it was great meeting you. We will be in touch. And I look forward to covering some of your companies. Thank you. Thank you for having you. me. It was, was a pleasure. Thank you to all the entrepreneurs. It's, uh, great, great ideas. And um, keep on going. Mm -hmm. uh, be safe, be productive, and we will see you next week. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.